Philosophers. Philosophers. Well, David, and all of you listening, we did not pick a topic for this week. So we're going to make one up. Oh, I thought you were going to say, so we're done. Philosophers. <laughs> so we're done. Philosophers. No, um, I'm not that cheesy. Um, so what we decided to do is uh, we just kind of talked for a little bit about what we could talk about in true philosopher's fashion. And we kind of came across a topic we feel like isn't too newsy, um, but is somewhat applicable. I think it's always applicable, honestly, as long as this technique is used, which I think will be always. Um, so we're going to talk about terrorism, like what it is and how, I guess, us as individuals can respond to it, perhaps, uh, and just about that in general. So uh, let's go ahead and start off with the the Oxford definition of terrorism. Uh, it's, um, it's a mass noun. Uh, it is the unlawful use of violence and intimidation, especially against civilians, in the pursuit of political aims. And that's the only definition. And I want to go ahead and begin and say that I take exception to this definition because of the first qualifying statement. Uh, well, the first qualifying word, and that's the unlawful use. So it's not terrorism if it's war, essentially, or your government is doing it to you, or someone else's government is doing it to you. You know, um, for example, in wartime, there are things called shock and awe campaigns. That's a much more positive sounding name, but in reality, it is terrorism. It is dominating excessively against your opponent or potentially even the civilians of the opposing entity with the whole goal of to break their spirit and will and then have them and to subjugate them through essentially just a show of force um, where actual deaths may not necessarily be a uh, high body count, but you show that you're capable of doing that. Um, so, and I think the 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 most classic example of this, honestly, is the uh, the atomic bombs in Japan are great examples of this. They, those were completely unnecessary, and there's a, there have been plenty of debates had over, you know, it saved more lives than it costs, or it it saved American lives at the expense of uh, Japanese lives. But regardless, it it did the 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 practical effect that it had <clears throat> is that it ended the war. Because, I forget the quote, but the Japanese emperor at the time uh, said that it wasn't that they had lost, it's that the Americans had cheated or something like that. It it was viewed as unfair and wrong. Like, it's, it's hard to say that there are rules in war and that there's a right way to war and a wrong way to war. But using nuclear weapons was viewed as the most wrong way you could war. Because not only is it absolutely devastating on every level, but it's permanent. And it scars. Uh, and it's horrifying. So, anyway. So that's that's my first nitpick with the definition of terrorism, is that it has to be unlawful. I, I, fi I find it... I just find that wrong. Like I don't think it matters who gives the authority... For something to happen like that, if you are using violence and intimidation, especially against civilians, but I think that goes without saying. I think I would swap that for individuals, you know, um, in the pursuit of political aims. So it's essentially, ex it's pretty much just a unlawful extortion. Well, extortion would be threatening people for, like, money. Right, but it, that's true. So I guess extortion is a form of, uh, yeah, it, extortion and terrorism, the only difference is one is for money and one is to advance your political goals, which could be funding. But anyway, uh, terrorism, it, this word's been around since the late 18th century, so late 1700s. Um, however, I, I don't have the Google Analytics pull up, but I have a feeling that it became more and more prominent in the modern era. Especially because uh, 
I think the like you and I had talked about this before, the defining event for our generation of people was nine eleven. It changed the world in a very fundamental way. And then we grew up in that world and the differences uh, that were that had occurred because of that is is the primary reason for the separation of generations between us and our parents, for example. Um, uh, there's plenty of anecdotes you could use, but like I, I know people whose parents fondly remember taking an airplane as a teenager, and it just wasn't a big deal. Now I, we don't know what an airport would be like without the TSA, for better or for worse. Um, and like, it's weird because we almost bear similarities to the Cold War generation in a way. I, I don't know about you, but I remember going to public school and having to do bomb training. Like, what do you do for active shooter training and active, like if there's a bomb threat, like, you know, it, it, it was just no different as a tornado drill or a fire drill. You know, we did, did them all. Interesting. We never did that at our school. Really? Really, um, yeah, nothing, not, no active shooter, no uh, bomb threats, nothing, nothing like that. Just our standard fire and tornado drill. Yeah, we 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 did that, and because there's a difference w with what you do. And for example, like during an active shooter. Uh, well, incident. okay. Now that now that I think about it, as I got up into like high school, we did start doing active shooter drills. Right, and I also feel like you had this pamphlet that was on like right next to every classroom door that had it was a color-coded pamphlet maybe that had different levels or different events like code colors like a code blue or code green or whatever and you would flip it to that page and it tells you what to do you know like there was one for chemical attacks for example and you you do different things depending on what what type of incident would have happened but that's but that was normal like most people i feel like in our generation have that knowledge that our parents wouldn't have uh, had that knowledge directly imparted to them, and especially not two generations ago. Um, we, we essentially swapped out what happens during a nuclear attack for what happens during an active shooter. And now, and instead of there being a red scare, there's a lone gunman scare or whatever. You know, there's people constantly afraid of terrorism in whatever name. You know, it doesn't really matter... You know, there are some who will bring it down to Islamic terrorism. There's white nationalist terrorism. It doesn't matter what the cause is. The methods they use are the same to try to advance their political goals via fear. And uh, so let's let's talk about that. Um, why you would even want to advance your goals this way. I, I feel like terrorism, it, to be frank, terrorism is a good tactic. It, it, objectively speaking, if you step back from morality and you don't take into account human lives lost and things like that, you know, if, if you were a purely like an alien observer that saw humans as on the same level as ants and every tactic one could use to advance a political agenda, terrorism is not a bad tactic, um, especially when you can do false flag terrorism, for example. Um, and I see you give me a weird look. It's effective. People, it, it preys on the human emotion of fear. Yeah, but uh, like, can can you name a, uh, a terrorist incident? You know, in the past, uh, let's say, twenty years, that has brought more people onto the side of the terrorists. Syria. Okay. For example, and again, I'm we're gonna stray close to conspiracy theory territory, so I'm gonna stay out of there. But I'm just going to say that. There is some compelling evidence that the gas attacks in Syria were committed by allied nations or funded by the CIA or some clandestine organization through another group to get more people involved. So you essentially false flag terrorism to someone else and then it sparks uh, people to rally against it because people it's not so much you essentially label whatever you don't like as terrorism. It's not terrorism itself, but without terrorism existing, there's nothing for you to cast, you know, the shadow on and say, or cast the light on and say, that's the problem. We should do that. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were primarily just America getting revenge. The Americans were riled up and wanted someone to pay. Um, we wanted retribution more than we wanted justice. It's not that we wanted to, and there, I feel like there was a, a goal in protecting ourselves. 
Like we wanted to feel, but it, it's not so much that you wanted to be safer. It's we wanted to feel safer. We going in and invading Afghanistan, Iraq, none of that made us any safer. And in fact, I think there's a good argument to say that it made us less safe because, you know, we go over there and the majority of the populations in these nations didn't, well, they weren't involved. And even if they saw it as so what, it happened all the way around the world. It's They were kind of agnostic to the whole thing. What they weren't agnostic to is predator drones and ground forces. You know, like in Afghanistan, uh, there's a compelling documentary talking about predator drones and how it it's changed what people... Because there's a whole generation of uh, Afghan kids that are about our age now that they've only ever known that predator drones exist and that gray skies were good days because they knew that the drones couldn't target them or they believed that the drone couldn't target them through clouds and blow up a, you know, a village or something like that. And that's terrible. That's terrorism. That's, you know, in my opinion. But, uh, so I think there's two ways there's, you can use terrorism as a justification to do other things. And it's powerful because you'll get an overwhelming support. Like if you look at the American approval ratings of George W. Bush before 9-11 and after, that united America. Democrats, Republicans, independents, you name it alike, all were chomping at the bit to get back at whoever did this. And there are people still today that call back to 9-11 and use it for political capital, you know. And because you can invoke fear with 9-11, um, especially to those who remember it and saw it on TV. Um, I don't think it necessarily serves as a rallying cry for those. Like, I don't think that there was a huge uprising or a spike in recruitment for, uh, was it Al-Qaeda who did 9-11, I think? No. But I, there's, I don't want to get it wrong, but I don't think there was necessarily a spike in recruitment for them. But I do think there was after we invaded, because now that we're on their doorstep, you know, so I think it's it's a mover. And that's what I mean by it's really influential. It may not drive people to your side directly, but it, you can use it to rally other people. Well, yes, it's influential. But your initial claim was that it's effective, an effective strategy. And so implicit in that is that it's an effective strategy for advancing your political aims. Right. But... It, it can be effective. Like, for example, the take the individual of the most recent terrorist event in New Zealand, for example, without going any, into any details. The person wrote out exactly what they wanted to happen, and it did. And it's because people are predictable when they act out of fear. It, you can it, it's it's you can use terrorism almost as a form of taunting, but you're taunting out of their sense of fear, not out of their sense of pride, you know? Um, also, it's it's a moralistic uh, weapon. If you want a population to live in fear, like a good, another good example is if you look at tyrannical governments, it's not technically terrorism because it's lawful if you're a dictator to do whatever you want. But if you reject the lawful part of the definition of terrorism, then... You can definitely use fear to motivate people to stay in line, you know, especially in an educated populace that doesn't realize that they have their oppressors outnumbered on factors of 10 to 1, you know, like hundreds, even thousands to 1, you know, they'll stay quiet. Um, and it's demoralizing. And I think, and go back to that original example of the atomic bomb, that's terrorism in my opinion. Like, in more time, it, it, it gets real blurry, the line. Some people are of the opinion that any act committed during wartime that is to deal damage is an act of terrorism as long as you are intentionally factoring in morale and you're wanting to do that. It's intentional terrorism. But that you can get... There, there's debates to be had over that. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I mean by that. I think it, it's, it depends on how you're using it. But... It's effective, I guess, in the way that you can make people respond to it. Like, if you had to look at protesting versus terrorism as a way to just make something happen, even if you can't control what happens, it's effective. Sure. And in, in, and in the, uh, 
in the in the methodology of trying to get your message across or make yourself known there's no way faster to make it to the top of an international news cycle than committing an act of terrorism for better or for worse there's no way faster to do it you know what i mean and i guess that's what i mean whether, whether or not it actually advances your political agenda in the way that you want uh it has nothing to do with the definition of terrorism it's just saying in the pursuit of political aims so you just have to have political motivations when you're committing this act um it, it will make people do, it will make people respond people will respond because you're preying on that most base human emotion of fear so that's i guess that's what i mean by effectiveness um i th i think where we go from there though is talking about how we as individuals can respond to acts of terrorism on both of the most minor scale to the most major scale like major scale being international incidents of terrorism um, like organized groups committing you know various types of attacks to whatever to very isolated incidents you know it's you could like for instance terroristic threatening you know that's a you can be arrested for that in the united states and all that is is essentially threatening someone seriously enough you know what i'm saying uh, it, it's kind of a dumb, in my opinion, it's kind of a dumb thing because it's no different than a threat, really. Um, I mean, yeah, they maybe had to prove that you have a motivation to do what you're trying to do, but I would argue that most people do everything with some type of motivation, you know? And uh, so, I'm going to kick it over to you for a minute and see what you think about how we... How would you respond to me terroristically threatening you or committing acts of terror to make you do something on a mo on a, like a personal scale? Well, um, I, I'm personally of the opinion that uh, that bending to a threat is uh, is generally a bad idea, uh, you know, because then all this will do is to reinforce the notion that threats are a good way to achieve your your aims, um, and so so all all efforts should be taken to not comply with a threat, um, or not not comply with the demand because of a threat, um, if it can be avoided. Um, so so I guess you know now now I guess terrorism is a little bit special because it's not exactly it, it, it it's usually not a personal threat um you know it's uh, it's a threat against uh you know a group normally uh or or an act against a group because you know if if somebody threatens somebody else or if somebody hurts or kills somebody else this is not terrorism even though it you know it it, it might you know, depending on on how you take the definition, it could it could still uh, have that attributed to it, but we don't see it that way. You know, if, if somebody kills somebody else, even if it was for a political reason, we just call it murder. It's not terrorism, right? Um, so, you know, it it, but in the case of you know a bomber or something like this, you know, you you don't you don't target one person with a bomb normally. Well, well, that's not necessarily true either. Um. Because there, there are people who will make uh, terroristic threats of uh, mailing somebody a bomb. Uh, so I don't know. Um, I think normally, I guess. Well, the thing, the thing about mailing a bomb is normally it's not do this or I'll mail you a bomb. It's I'm going to mail you a bomb because you did this or because you stand for this or because you believe this. And uh, it's it's a. Generally, I think targeting an ideology, it's because you share in this ideology, I'm mailing you a bomb and let that be a lesson to anyone else that would follow in your footsteps. And you try to, you know, quash an ideology. So anyway, um, I, I agree. I think not responding to those threats. Now, I do think we have to be careful. There is something there is a difference between acknowledging a threat and responding to the threat. I think one of. I think you you must do one but not the other. You must acknowledge the threat but not respond to it. And to and to put that in perspective, if you don't take a terroristic threat seriously and you just tell you just ignore it, it will continue to get worse because 
all that I think communicates to the person who would be committing the act of terrorism is that they don't take you seriously. You're going to need to step it up and go the next level. And that might be actually mailing someone a bomb. And then if they still don't get it, you mail more bombs or you mail deadlier bombs. Something like that. Man, you know this video is going to end up on so many different lists after we post this. Because we've said the word bomb like 30 times. But still. Um, and not only that, but usually... And what makes it terrorism is that you're trying to advance an ideology or a political philosophy. You're trying to make a statement. You're trying to make a statement. You're trying to communicate something to people. By not allowing... It, and that's one of the arguments for free speech is that let those people air their concerns, let them be heard, and then respond to their arguments instead of letting them bottle it up or find other extremists like them and be able to create their echo chambers to reinforce one another and it manifests in violence. And then you have someone that says, screw your optics, I'm going in, and then it it happens. You know what I mean? And someone actually does something, you know. Um it's i think that's definitely important too like you have to let people and and don't be wrong i don't think that that will stop every incident for example there are people out there with bad ideas that will never be accepted in the mainstream or by even a plurality of people because they're bad ideas but i think you run a greater chance of exposing that person acknowledge them give them the decency of at least hearing them out and then telling them why they're wrong and they will still disagree with you maybe but i think it would be a lot harder for someone to go from that point to having said their piece to then well because you i told you and you didn't listen so now i'm going to do this and it's well no i didn't listen it's just still wrong you know um i think that's important do you think that we will always deal with acts of terrorism as, yes. a, as a human race? Yes. Uh, it's, it's, uh, well, I mean, I, I can think of maybe conditions in which it, uh, in which it would be, it would be done with, but, uh, the, these, these seem fairly utopic to me, um, that, you know, it, it, it's, it's out of our reach to, uh, to get, our society to a point where terrorism won't be a thing because there there will continue to be people who feel uh that they are repressed and that their only option is to uh is to act out violently yeah i think so as well and and that's unfortunate really i think it is uh, what about mitigating factors for terrorism how do you mean do, what do you th do you think there are ways we can mitigate um whatever it would be that would cause a person to resort to terrorism. Cause I don't think anyone jumps to, I'm just going to commit acts of terror to get my point across. I think there's a gradient that occurs. I, I don't exactly know what it would be, but I do think people start with an idea and then gradually move towards terrorism from the acceptance of that idea. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are clear stepping stones that can be identified where somebody goes from maybe a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an advocate to an activist to maybe a, a one or two other stepping stones to a terrorist. Um, you know, th there's definitely a, a way that people can still support their ideas and and not and not uh, resort to to violence. Um, hmm, I've lost track of the question. It's what factors, like what 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 can do to mitigate that advancement down that path? Well, I, I think that uh, you, you've already mentioned it, which is uh, giving giving people a platform who feel like they have something to say. Um, and, and, and and I I wish that I could uh, could remember the quote. It's kind of long. Maybe I can uh, maybe I can find it so we can link it. Uh, uh, Christopher Hitchens gave a speech on uh, on free speech. I, actually, I think it was part of a debate. Uh, in which he he said that you know you take you take somebody who nobody in society takes seriously like a Holocaust denier I think is the example he used, um, and and you know the the, the people who who say well you know what uh you know maybe this isn't all 
maybe, maybe the history about about the Holocaust isn't you know all that we we thought it was. You know, and, and this this person, although he's probably wrong, is probably the person that should most be listened to because amidst the nonsense, he will probably have some nugget of truth uh, that hasn't been considered. Um, and, and, and then, you know, as it, but, but it, that, that was the angle that he was coming at it as he, cause he wasn't talking about terrorism at the time. Um, but, but along the, along the same veins, these are the people who need to be listened to because if they aren't, then they'll act out in other ways. Yeah, I agree. It, think, it's much better to create a system in which anyone who has an opinion, no matter how controversial, is able to voice it and and put it under the scrutiny of others directly, rather than uh, uh than than everybody ignoring them and then feeling like they have no other option. Yeah, I agree. I think that's definitely uh, one of the things we can do. I think something else we can do as well is. Because there, I think there are two types of terrorists, um, two types of people that generally become terrorists, or you can categorize terrorists into these two groups. There are people who were born into an ideology, and then it just, over their lifetime, it started extreme and just kept getting more extreme. But I think more commonly, what you do is you find that there are, because terrorists, generally speaking, are well-educated. They are. There's not very many dumb terrorists out there. And it's not because the dumb terrorist gets caught before they're able to actually commit noble acts of terrorism. It's that they, they like for example, Osama bin Laden went to the uni- went to university in the United. I think he went to the United States or Britain. I think I can't remember. He was a college edu- He was college educated. You know, in the West, um, surrounded by Western ideals and things like that, and he still did and led what he did supposedly. Right. Um. And and at those times, he was able to vent his philosophy uh, to the world. Um, a lot of other terrorists are this way as well. They they generally, they will have echo chambers, but a lot of them spend significant amounts of time under a condition where they might have free speech, where they could just say what they're thinking. Um, and then they're just not taken seriously or what have you. But I think there's... I. Th- I think we might be able to mitigate acts of terrorism by mitigating the philosophies on which terrorism is generally built. For example, any I I would say that any ideology could have a terrorist support it and be the source of its terrorism. You know, you could be an eco-terrorist because you believe that the environment is so important that if I don't do something drastic to push the awareness of the message, the world will be destroyed because of climate change. For example, that that exists. Just as in uh, same thing with religious terrorism for any type of religion. But what I think the problem is is that. In order for, I think, someone to become a terrorist, you have to have bought in entirely to your ideology. And not only that, but it becomes symbolic of your identity as well. And identitarianism in general, which is the process of taking your beliefs and identifying yourself by your beliefs or other factors that aren't, that are not on the scale of just you as an individual, right? I think if we were able to, instead of indoctrinating children, for example, which you may it may not be entirely possible, I'll be honest, but if we were able to push the notion of separating your ideals and your values from yourself, I think that might be a mitigating factor as well. Because if you realize that these are just things that I believe and that I can change them, if I'm confronted with better evidence or an idea that I like better or that makes more sense or is more accurate to reality, then I can, you won't be so tightly bound to those ideals so that you don't even get to the point where you're willing to commit acts of terrorism to them because you're not so tied to them. Right. I think we, I think we mentioned this a little bit in our first episode, actually, about, uh, about, being open to uh to new information and not binding your 
beliefs to your identity um you know right uh because because th- th- that that is a a very good way to uh to lock yourself out of the truth is to uh make make your belief so part of your identity that you're not willing to consider any uh possibly conflicting ideas or information right and i think one way you can put this to the test is because i think the first test i would want to do is see is there an ideology that a cannot be used as a source of terrorism that you couldn't commit terrorism in the name of um and so, i did, go ahead well maybe um cuz uh, i i almost jumped in when you said uh, that uh, that terrorism could uh, easily be done in the name of any religion uh but uh, there's a uh, there's a there's an example that uh, Sam Harris uses frequently as uh, as one such uh, or a counterexample, I should say, which is Jainism, um, which is the the. I, I guess I can't say the only because I'm uh, I'm not educated on every world religion, but one of the few truly nonviolent religions where they're, they're like, I will I'll quote Sam directly in saying, uh, "The crazier you get as a Jain, the less we have to worry about you." Uh, because it is is the the religion of of nonviolence in every aspect. You know, they they watch where they step, so they make sure not to step on bugs. They filter their water through cheesecloth when they drink it, so they don't swallow any bugs. It's crazy. Um, wow. The, these people, yeah, they they would, yeah, they, they would wish harm on themselves before literally anything else. Yeah, I'm having a hard time coming up with a way you could terrorize using Jainism. <laughs> Right. But I feel like there's also, it's not always the terrorism is supported by an ideology necessarily directly. I think a lot of it also has to do with the fact that the people will misappropriate ideolo- ideologies for terroristic uses too. Like, I could see someone taking the stance that in order to prevent the majority of, you take the utilitarian approach to Jainism, if you want to minimize the absolute most violence possible in the net outcome you might run the equation in a way that I just need to annihilate all human beings. Well, you know, I, I or... don't. I don't think that that is necessarily the the framework from which they're coming up with their conclusion to be nonviolent. Though I don't know a whole lot about Jainism, but I imagine it's not some utilitarian thing about we need to minimize you know suffering or something like that. No, but it's about. I, I think it's more about like believing in like the spirits of things or something like that. I don't know. I guess it's, then it is possible, but there's also the notion that people have to, I guess, then willingly accept that philosophy. Yes, I don't know the um, the the process of converting to a to become a Jane. Yeah, but I think as long as you give people the freedom to choose, there will be those who will choose to study and maybe even put themselves into echo chambers of other philosophies that will end you in a place where you could potentially end up as a terrorist but um so there's there i guess there are some philosophies that would not be conducive to acts of terror or we could take something non-religious and kind of generic the philosophy of pacifism yeah by definition by definition you cannot be a terrorist on behalf of pacifism. Right. Uh, that's a good point because it could be any philosophy. So I guess there are certain, so I guess you could say there might be a sliding scale as to how susceptible an ideology is to terrorism. I think that's directly impinging on how your philosophy views violence and how willing it is to accept that violence is going to occur and will occur or and that you should use it or how you view using it um for example um i anarchism for example is a there's there's a different kind of anarchism for every possible combination of numbers it seems um because there are some anarchists that are pacifistic anarchists that believe that violence is wrong no matter what even if, even in response to violence, violence is wrong. Then there's the more extreme anarchists, where we would call them extreme, where 
no violence is always justified and you should you it should be in fact it's the only legitimate way to make things happen and it's the only legitimate way to make things happen is that all human interactions essentially is violence just to varying degrees you know and so it, it normalizes physical violence for things like emotional or spoken words that are harmful to psyches and things like that. It, it puts all of those things in the same boat and and says that they're going to all happen. So what's the point in separating one from the other, you know? So I... But I don't think we should necessarily push our... I guess the next question is, is violence a part of reality, though? Like, is... Is could I don't think that we could ever truly reach a place where violence is no longer I won't say necessary, but I think violence is a reality of being physical entities that all things and even even things that aren't living things act in a violent way. Well, it doesn't even have to be with being physical, with being human, uh, and not not to say that. Uh, that humans, uh, you know, have to be violent about things. But you know, let, let's imagine we live in a in a, in a utopia. Okay, we have everything that we need, so we're not we're not fighting over resources. There are no resources over which to fight. Uh, well, depending on how you define resources, because I'm about to go somewhere. Um, but we we still have social interactions because we're social creatures, and we have things that we want out of life, and we haven't foregone these for our utopia. Um, you might uh you might have a spouse and your spouse might decide to cheat on you um and you will still have your psychological reaction to this which will probably manifest in violence um you know unless unless we've come up with some sort of way to to train people never to do this and so yeah i imagine that uh that that things like this will will still happen even in a in a otherwise perfect society um that that we, we still have our psychological reactions to things that make us violent. Right. Well, and what I, where I was going with it is that there are non-sentient forces that are violent as well. Like, to, to put it bluntly, what we refer to, what, what insurance agencies would refer to as acts of God are inherently violent. You know, storms are violent events, and they are just nature. Um. And we are of the same nature without without appealing to the philosophy, without appealing to the fallacy of appealing to nature. You know, it, it's a fact of reality that violence occurs against us and that violence is one way. There are many different philosophies on violence, OK, but they all begin by acknowledging that violence is essentially synonymous with being alive. That like, for instance, a lot of times they'll refer to the the mere act of being born is violent. You know, we all start out in a state of violence, you know, because it, it causes harm to somebody. And don't get me wrong in the short term and maybe even in the long term, but, and, and we commit acts of violence against ourselves, you know, uh, depending on how you define violence. Um, and there are types of violence that we don't look at as bad, you know, People watch boxing and MMA, and most sports are violent in some way, shape, or form, and we don't see anything wrong with it. Um, to to not stray too close to Heinleinian ideas on libertarianism, he viewed violence as the only true way to act, adequately communicate a message to someone. Um and the only true way to learn anything like for example the fastest way to learn not to put your hand on a hot stove is to get burned by the hot stove that that you will remember that way faster and more permanently than someone just telling you not to like while words are good ways of communicating lessons from one person to the other so they don't have to experience that I think when you look at the reality of the minds of a th- the, the the minds of a human child, you know, and I'm taking I'm talking about the youngest humans that don't really comprehend language on any real level yet, you know, a, a two or three month old person. If you hold up a oh what are they called a mouse trap or like a really weak one, you're not going to leave any 
permanent damage by any means. You hold it up, and they stick their hand in it, and they get snapped by it. Even though they have very malformed brains at this point, or ill-formed, and they're not able to, like, remember things very well, they will remember that. They won't do it again. You know what I mean? And then there are instinctual things that are just things we avoid because they are they usually symbolize some types of violence you know what i mean there's a rational fear of like snakes for instance that even infants are afraid of snakes you know there's something instinctual about that and even if we were able to train out the violent response i don't think that we it would take many generations to evolve out the responses we have to violence which are violent you know we respond violently to violence you know it's it's you can't really pacifistically respond to violence in a one-on-one scenario like that with any real effect i mean you can run away from the violence but that's only as effective as your capability to do that and there are things that you can't run away from you know so i I don't think it's practical for us to look at ways of i don't think you can eliminate violence from people i think you might be able to i think it's one of those things that we will have to learn to control which we do you and i upon a disagreement usually and and have not yet and i doubt ever will resort to physical violence because we don't need to there are instances in which i am unsure whether or not i wouldn't resort to physical violence granted they're extreme incidences but you know when you're when your life is threatened anyone you your your response will become violent sometimes against your will because you will preserve yourself if you can you know and and so it's one of those things where violence begets violence but violence can be started by anything you know violence does not always have to start with a person people will respond violently to acts of nature and then hurt somebody else and then that kicks off a chain of violence and i think it's i think the better approach is to maybe learn how we can control that violence in a way that is reasonable in a way that we can as a species use it because violence is a tool in a way it, it, it's just a definite it's, violence is really just defining a set of activities i think or divi- it's defining the outcome of an activity you know like for example you can do something that we wouldn't normally say is violent violently um a good example people can dance but you can also dance violently (laughs) or you can uh uh, a common one i hear is like a a violent expulsion you know or when you have to chuck or vomit i guess whatever vernacular you're you're using you can do that in a violent way you know and it's that's usually being associated with it's a rapid loud or uh very offensive to your normal everyday levels of sensing you know there are violent smells for example right um but i think that's just a degree to which a person will be affected like if it's a violent effect on somebody then it causes them i think you can almost define it as anything that would cause a person a, a person your rational person to respond with violence whatever that means you know i don't know at this point i think i'm just vomiting violently words at this point but the long and the short of what i guess i'm trying to get to is that we can't we can't get rid of violence no we i think need to figure out not as a collective necessarily because you can't i don't think achieve anything on a collective level it needs to be something where we change the way we respond to things that are violent as individuals you know but because i think that's truly what terrorism is it's just a violent act against another person 
for a political reason. And I, we can't get rid of political reasons, the other half of that, because everything, anytime you have more than one person in a room, it gets political. You know, if you take the true definition of politics, which is just human societal structure is politics. Um, that will always occur. I don't think we could ever reach a state in which two people could be in a room together and there not be some type of politics going on. You know? Right, it's too deep in our psychology. It's, it's, I think it's just as deep, if just as deep as violence. Probably not quite as deep, because even creatures that have zero capability for social structure are still violent. But it, it's practically just as deep for, for uh, as far as our ability to change is concerned. So... With that all being said, I think that we should focus on ways to mitigate that rise to extremism. And I think I think one of the first places we could look at is tribalism, which we've talked about before. But tribalism, most people who commit acts of terrorism, even if they are lone guns or they're lone wolves or whatever, whatever they're called, people who commit acts of terrorism alone... They didn't probably reach that state of ideological absorbance alone. You know, they didn't absorb that ideology and make it such a core part of themselves by themselves. You know, right? Even if they, well, and, and I, I could say that you could, you could, you could still say that even if they did all of the, uh, the learning about that ideology on their own, they have still, you know, they're still, you know, reading or watching material from other people to, uh, to, to get their ideas fundamentally, um, you know. We can, you know, take, uh, uh, you know, religious terrorists who will go see what, uh, you know, uh, prominent religious figures had to say about something and they'll internalize that and then uh, can, can be can be radicalized this way. And it can happen. Uh, it it can happen, you know, for any number of things, um, you know, whether, you know, interacting directly with people or not, it is it is still a, a social thing where, where they are identifying themselves with a, with a group and then taking what you know, what they perceive to be leaders to say, et cetera. Right. Or they could, a good example too, is um, people reading books written by other people. Now, I think this is going to kind of touch back to, I forget what episode it was. Uh, Oh, it was our episode on taboos where let's, let's take what we've discussed so far and put it in an example. Shall we? I write a book that, when read by the average person will motivate them to violence and committing acts of terrorism, right? Like for whatever reason, it's just, it's just so good at doing that, that say 50%, one half of the people that read this go on to commit acts of terrorism within five years, we'll say, or it starts them down the path. Is that a justification to ban that book? No. Why? Well, if we just want to look at consequences of banning it, um, then I think that the likely outcome of banning it is just going to be that more people are going to try their best to uh, to access it, and you'll end up creating more terrorists that way than you would just leaving it on its own. Let people decide for themselves, well, this book is apparently dangerous. I don't want to read it. Okay, let's change the scenario. There's one copy of this book. I only wrote one. I hand wrote it. It has no copies duplicated anywhere else, and you have to go to a specific place to read this book. You cannot take it with you. And while other people might be able to communicate its ideas, you find that someone secondhandly communicating the idea has zero effect on whether or not someone else is going on to commit terrorism. Like, you've done scientific studies. Let's say you have near omniscient studies on this where you just know from just tons and tons and tons of studies that... It doesn't matter if someone's read this book. They won't be able to radicalize other people. But only people who read the book in its entirety become uh, radicalized, right? Then well, is it a justification to ban access to that book? Well, now you've discovered magic, so... But but I'm saying this is, but this is a hypothetical scenario. A hypothetical magic scenario. Uh, well, what makes it magic? That That there is something about the book specifically that makes it so potent you know that the, it's not the information within but the fact that it's from the book like this is well no, no 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 it's that the people who read the book in its entirety it's both the setting they're in when they read it and that they read it from cover to cover it has everything in a context that makes it a lot easier to absorb and radicalize someone that 
can't effectively be duplicated because the human isn't able to remember all parts of the book. Like, just say it's not as effective. Or, or let's just say those people then go away and they are able to convert, but it's at a lower rate because they're not able to effectively recall okay. all the context. That's a little more realistic than a magic book. It's just a normal book. But the words are arranged in such a way that one read, when read, half of the people exposed to it immediately are so convinced and internalize the... I don't know. At this point, like it, it, it starts to matter like just what's in this book. Like why why are these people so radicalized? Is it because it actually has good ideas in it that you know you know what? You know we and, and of course this is a totally hypothetical book, so there are no answers to these questions. Right, but does it matter to those answers, I guess? Yes. Okay, why does it matter? I I'm not trying to get at your goat here. I'm trying to figure out what you know. Well sure, like like if you if you discovered like some some truth that is largely unknown to society um and knowing about it or hearing about it in a particular way happens to make people violent we shouldn't suppress the truth okay hypothetically of course you hypothetically know, of course. it could be that you've just fabricated something deliberately to get people stirred up in which case i don't know um, but that, that does bring in that does bring into question an interesting concept. The more say the more we learn about the reality and the more truths we uncover, we uncover a truth that we should commit acts of terrorism for some reason. Does that justify it? Even though that's doesn't appear to be the case right now. Say we discover like for example that a god is real, like we can prove it. And this God says you should go commit acts of terrorism. Well, then this opens up a totally different can of worms of if there is a if there is a God who tells you to do things that you'd otherwise consider immoral, should you still do them? Like, does the does God have the authority to, you know, to to tell you what to do just because he created the universe? You know, yeah, and then we, yeah. Get, we start going into all kinds of other tangents that. Sure. Yeah. I, I don't know. The, the point I was trying to get to is that. You know, I first of all, I don't think a certain message exists that will always turn people, or even to the fifty percent ratio, to acts of terrorism. Um, well, that's sort of why I was going at you for for creating a magic book because that that's basically what it would take. Right, but the, and that's the thing that I'm trying to get at though is, it, but so let's say it's not so magic, but. It, <sighs> It's a book that encourages violence, and we find that people who read it are then encouraged to violence. Is the problem the book, or is the problem the people that are then encouraged to violence? I think the problem lies with the people who are encouraged to violence. I, see, I agree, but th th the point I was trying to get at with all this, even though it's a kind of a shoddy metaphor, to be honest, in hindsight... Banning anything or trying to suppress sources that you think contribute to terrorism won't solve the problem. And because that's not the problem, it's the people who commit acts of terrorism. Uh, there's no such thing as a terrorist book, for example. There are no such thing as terrorist words um, or ideas even um, because they don't they can't commit acts of terrorism. Only people can. Um, I, maybe some higher functioning other mammals can commit terrorism, I guess, but that's, we don't really generally care given our place in the food chain. Um, but I wanted that to be said because one of the things that has been circulating with a more recent act is the notion of stifling out the message and trying to conceal the message that was laid out by a person who did something terrible. And I get it, you know, there's a human response to not even want to associate with anything that is also associated with something inherently negative, you know? Uh, and this can go to some really ir irrational places. Like, for example, uh, you could take someone to a house that they don't know who lived there, who was there, whatever, and say, would you like to go inside and or would you want to stay the night here it's a, it's a bed and breakfast let's say and people will say sure i'll stay inside it's just a bed and breakfast then you tell them yeah but the bread and breakfast uh built used to 
the person who used to live here and the person who built the house was the world's most notorious stealer, serial killer. Would you still want to stay the night here? And people will not want to because it's just associated with that. And they don't want to be associated in any way, shape or form with that. Even though it's just a house, it's no different depending on who live there. Right. But people still won't want to stay there. Like, would you stay in the house of a, of a serial killer? Yeah. Yeah. But, but I'm not superstitious. But I know, but, but there are plenty of people who are, you know, and that's interesting. People, there's this innate desire to just not be associated. And, and, and that's pretty obvious too, you know. Have you ever been called a Nazi? I don't think so. Well, I have. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Not because of anything particular that I did. It's just that someone, and, and I honestly think it was a mistake. Uh, I think that I got misidentified as someone else. Um, but my first response was to deny it immediately. And it wasn't so much that I wasn't a Nazi. It was that I don't even want to be associated with that at all because I am so, you you see what I'm saying? And uh, people just don't want to be associated with something that. Well, I think, okay, but that's a, that's a special case because if you're associated with something that is, you know, generally uh, considered, you know, totally taboo, like Nazism or racism or something like that, then nobody takes you seriously anymore either. And so, so, you know, it's, it's not, it's not the association in and of itself that is bad. It's how everybody else will see you because of it. And, and, you know. Right. But fine. That, that's the, maybe the reason, but if someone communicates a message committing an act of terrorism, people, you, we, we, this is what you said in the beginning is that you challenge my assertion that it's effective, Right. People won't want to believe your message or even discuss your message. And in the light of some of the more recent incidences that have happened, people have wanted to essentially censor out that person's message who committed an act of terrorism. And I found myself disagreeing with that notion because in a more extreme form, it's like separating the art from the artist in a way. Um, in the age we live in now, there might have been, pick your favorite movie from pre-2000. Someone involved in making that film was probably a terrible person, you know? Say the director, you didn't know enough about it, but it comes out that that director was a a horrible person. Do you still like the movie? Well, yeah, because while he had a hand in it, he or she had a hand in it back then, that doesn't change what that movie is, you know, the, the information laid out in that specific configuration to make that movie didn't change. Only your perception of the person who was involved and associated with it changed. But that can be enough sometimes to drive people to try to push things away. Sure. Well, we've already mentioned Nazis, but, uh, you know, Hitler made some pretty good paintings before he became the Hitler that we all know. Right. Hitler also was a strong advocate of environmentally friendliness. You know, like, I'm just saying, that doesn't mean environmentally friendliness is wrong. But as far as what we knew about the environment then, he he was on the right side of those arguments for what we now acknowledge as being the correct assessment of, like, things like deforestation and ethical mining procedures. Like, he was in favor of those, for example. I can't confirm that, but let's just say he was for the sake of the argument because it could be true. It, it, just because you're associated with the idea doesn't mean the ideas are not bad. A bad person being associated with a good idea doesn't affect the idea. That's the whole point. Ideas should stand on their own, regardless of who accepts and believes or propagates the idea. You know. So when we find ourselves in an event where a terrorist commits an act of terror, but they also wrote a manifesto about it where 90% of the manifesto was the truth and 10% wasn't. And it was the part that made him whatever. We shouldn't turn that away from people just because of who wrote it. You need to let the idea stand on its own. And I feel like that is one way terrorism can be used effectively as well. If you want to conceal the truth, for your own gain, you know, like say if I was able to come up with some type of truth that would bring about 
much greater prosperity for people. Um, but I didn't want it to get out to people because I, I, by knowing it, I could have an advantage over someone else. You could have someone commit an act of terror with that in their manifesto and that would be disregarded then just because people were afraid of it, you know? And even if it is a bad idea, there's nothing wrong. I don't think there should be anything wrong with entertaining a bad idea. There's the same thing as we talked about when we talked about taboos. There's no idea bad enough that no one, that people shouldn't be able to at least hear about it and discuss it. Right, because to assume otherwise is just to say that, you know, we can't ever trust people to think for themselves. That we, because Because you're basically saying this idea is dangerous by its very existence and we can't trust people to uh, to think critically and uh and you know be able to decide for themselves whether it's worth believing right and that's i think the heart of it and so when it comes down to because we, we talked a lot about terrorism tonight and i think that's one of the most poignant impacts of terrorism is not so much it but the things that are associated with it and i think and that's really i think would be a better, maybe not a better definition, but I think that's one thing that's more important that occurs every time terrorism happens is this, you be, you associate ideas with fear. You make people afraid of an idea because of its association with an act. You know, um, my feelings about whether or not, like I, we talked about our feelings on religion during our Christianity series. That doesn't just apply to Christianity. You know, there's a lot of things in there that we talked about that were about religions in general. And I'm doing all this prefacing to say, I have opinions about Islam, which are almost exactly in line with my opinions about Christianity and why I think it's wrong. But none of them have anything to do with the fact that terrorism was committed in the name of Islam. And for me to give that a special uh, assignment would be hypocritical, you know. You could always go back and look at the name, the name, you know, the number of atrocities committed in the name of Christianity. It's all the same. And using that as a justification is wrong. For me to say, yeah, well, someone did something bad while believing this. So so what? So what? It doesn't matter. There were people who've committed the name terrible acts in the name of progressing science. Eugenics is a good example. Um, a lot of what Hitler's scientists did was in the name of, pro and don't be wrong, they progressed science and they did terrible things. At the same time. At the same time. Believe it or not, people can do more than one thing at the same time. And I won't say, I won't even say that it was justified what they did. I don't think that it works like that. But we're, we're and if I were given the chance to stop someone who would duplicate it, with a new technological advancement, but at a cost of a human's freedom and life, I would still try to stop it because that's not the way we need to go about it. And so you can separate the idea from the people and what was taken to get to it. But in in the past, let's say, uh, because I think there's no such thing as future terrorism. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not real. It's possible, but it's not real. You can look into the future and say, yes, doing this thing would be wrong. Even if I knew what I was, even if I knew that I was going to learn something important, but it was going to come at this cost. If the cost is wrong, it's bad. If it happened in the past, it can still be bad, but it's already happened. And the ideas are already out there. So they're free game, you know? And I guess that's the biggest thing I wanted to say about it is that firstly, we, to kind of wrap it all up is that we shouldn't respond to terrorism because that's the fastest way to legitimize terrorism and give it and give encouragement for more terrorism. But you should acknowledge the ideas on which terrorism is. You shouldn't disregard ideas because terrorism is committed in their name because ideas stand alone from the individual who is doing something in their name, as I think is where we can sum this up. Ultimately, uh, I don't think I have anything else to put on top of it. Do you? No, I agree. All right. Philosophers. Philosophers.